Okay, well, this morning we will be in Ephesians chapter 4. So you can turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. We'll be looking at that together, uh, beginning with the first six verses of Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, you can turn there. Ephesians chapter 4. And let's, uh, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll look at the word together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you've left for us in this this glorious book, the, the instructions we have for how to have a relationship with you, to how to come to know you better, how to be more like you, that you've given us everything we need to know. And it's, like I've said before, by no means all I want to know, but I'm grateful that you've left me everything we need to know about who you are and what you've done and the love that you have for us. Oh, what a good God we serve. And I pray that you'd be with us this morning. And as we look at your word, that you would speak to our hearts and that we would hear what it is you have to say to us. You're glorious, O oh Lord. Be with us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, like I said, this morning we're beginning Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll be only getting through the first six verses, but let's read through the chapter and then we'll come back to our text that we're going to look at for today. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, begins with this. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Verse 9, now this, he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Verse 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness in their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak with truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who, who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give who has in need. Verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. So what did the chapter start with? It started with, I, therefore. 
I therefore, that's how the chapter start, starts. Paul spent three chapters in Ephesians spelling out in wondrous detail, in lots of detail, all that God did for us, all that he did freely by his grace. And now here in chapter four, he brings the call for us to live rightly. That, But he only did that after explaining everything that God had done for us. He writes these instructions as our right response to all that God has done. And I think when we really begin to understand how much God has done for us, the natural response should be, it should be the desire to serve him and obey him in gratitude. We should have the desire to walk worthy of the call with which we were called. We should have that desire when we look at all that God has done for us. And it should be a desire given out of gratitude for all that God has done, uh, not out of a desire to try and earn merit from God or out of a self-righteous feeling of duty toward God, but it should be a love response to him. We don't walk worthy of the call so that God will love us. That's not why we would walk worthy to the call, but we should walk worthy to the call because God loves us. So verse 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now there's an old adage when reading and interpreting the Bible, that when you read, therefore, you should ask, what is it therefore? So Paul is begging his readers to listen carefully and to respond to what he's about to say. But the key question is why? Why is he doing that? And why is, is a therefore there? And it means since these things are so, therefore, or since these things are so. So when we read this, therefore, we should be asking what is Paul referring to and why is he beseeching? Which means fiercely begging, beseeching, fiercely begging us to listen. And it's a fervent longing. You can look at the language used and say the, the phrase this way. Since all these things are true. Since all these things are true, I fervently beg you with all of my heart to listen to me now. That's what Paul's saying. He built three chapters, three chapters of talking about all these things. And now he's saying, since all these things are true, I'm fervently begging you to listen to me now. And he's about to tell us that because all that God has done for us, our duty to God is to act on what Paul instructed us in the first three chapters. And he begs us to, therefore, that begs us to respond. But it also begs us to base that response on the groundwork that Paul laid in the first three chapters, on what we saw and what we know to be true based on those chapters. Now, we reviewed it all last week, but if Paul is begging us to respond to what he wrote in those first few chapters, it really is important we remember the context of this transition right here. Because this changes the tone of the book of Ephesians from all the things that God had done for us to now what a response should be of a Christian in light of all of that. The rest of the book, the next three chapters, is all the response to what Paul built in those first three chapters. So, let's review it again. In chapter 1, Paul looked at our position in Christ. And what's our position in Christ? It's grace. Our position in Christ is built on grace. It's not anything we could ever earn. It's the free gift of God. Grace is our position in Christ. And we looked at the work that Christ has done with us for redemption. And we've seen the riches of his glory that we have in the work of the Holy Spirit. And that was just where he started in the first chapter. We have a position with God through grace, his free gift to us through the price Jesus Christ paid for our redemption. Buying us back from slavery to sin and death, giving us his love, extending to us his life, and give, grafting us into his very family so that we could share in the inheritance of Jesus Christ. And on top of all that, Paul tells us that Jesus sent to us the helper, the Holy Spirit, to seal us, to be the guarantee of our inheritance, mercy, grace, love. What amazing things. And all we need to do to receive it is ask. That's all we have to do. It's the free gift of God available to anybody that asks. There really is no better deal in all of eternity for any person that we exchange the slavery to sin and death, our chain to sin and death, which is in our flesh nature, and we exchange that for freedom and life in Jesus Christ. 
Grace is free to us. It's absolutely free to us. But it still had a cost. But that cost was borne by Jesus Christ. So grace is free to us, but it cost Christ everything to extend that deal to us, all because of his love. And through his love for us, we have extended to us the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance, and the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. And Paul ended chapter 1 by talking about the ultimate example of God's power being the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he spoke of how the church is a body, that we come together as one, many different backgrounds, many different uh, uh, stages of life, many different places in all the world. But every single person that comes to know Jesus Christ, we are told in the Bible, come into his family. We're all grafted into one family, the family of God. That's what he's done for us. And then chapter 2 began. Paul looked at the implications of that resurrection power in our life. And he went on to tell us of the wonders of the grace we have access to through Jesus Christ. That we were dead. That we are alive in Christ. And that we will see all of God's grace and kindness for the rest of eternity. All because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on our behalf. All because of his willingness to step out of eternity, to step out of glory, and to step in with victory, and in the middle of all of our sin and failure, he stepped in. And as we look at all that, like Paul did, we can still say, but God has made the way, in spite of all that we have in our lives, in spite of all that we've done in our lives, in spite of all the failures that we do time and time again, but God has made the way to have relationship with him. And in chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, we saw these verses. It says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and not that, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God saves us not merely to save us from the wrath we rightly deserve, but also to make something beautiful of us. It says we are his workmanship, which translates the Greek word poema. What does that word sound like? Well, it's where we get our word for poem. The Greek word poema, his workmanship. That's who you are in Christ. He said that you are his beautiful poem. The New Living Bible translates that word as masterpiece. The NIV translated as handiwork. The Jerusalem Bible translates workmanship as work of art. God's love is a transforming love and it meets us right where we're at and it doesn't just leave us there, but he continues to work on us. God begins with salvation and then he begins to write himself all over us, all over our lives, in every way man imaginable. He creates you as his masterpiece. He makes you his handiwork. He makes you his work of art. We are his workmanship, his poem, his masterpiece, his handiwork, his creation. Something new he has made out of us in Jesus Christ. And when you come to Christ, God begins inscribing himself on you. And God, the truth is, God is inscribing himself on you. I don't know if you always feel that way, but he is inscribing himself on you. Look at all creation. And inside of all the beauty and majesty throughout the entire universe, I've been all over our nation, just in California alone, going to Yosemite or to Yellowstone or driving across this nation. You see all the beauty of nature and what God created. And yet inside of all of that beauty, what does he see as his greatest work of art? He sees you. You are his greatest work of art. He created all that beauty for us to enjoy. Not for us to worship, but for us to enjoy and to be stewards of. We are to be stewards of what God has given us. We are to tend to it. But his work of art, he sees as you. Do you feel that way? The thought should humble you completely. That that's how God sees you. It humbles me to think that God would see me with that much love. When I look around me at everything else he created, it's like David said, well, who am I? Who am I, O oh Lord, that you would see that? When he looked at the heavens and he said, the, ma the heavens declare the majesty of God. And he goes, who am I? Who am I, O oh Lord? The thought should humble you. What beauty and grace then. For God to love us so much to extend us salvation through grace so that you could be his poem. 
his masterpiece, his handiwork, his work of art, his workmanship. And it's all with a purpose. It's not without purpose. He didn't do that for no reason or just to do it. It says <clears throat> that we are his workmanship that are created for something. What are we created for? We're created for good works in Christ. That's what we are supposed to be doing. The beautiful thing that God is making of us is to be active in good works. All through the grace of God. All that. We have all that in grace. What an amazing thing we have in the grace of God. For by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast because he knows our hearts and we would. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanships. In Philippians 1.6, it says this. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You are his workmanship, and he sees you as something very beautiful. Even inside of all of our fleshly ugliness, he still sees the beauty. The master sees you as you will be. We are his workmanship created for good works in Christ and his promise is that he's going to complete that work until the day of Jesus Christ, which means he knows we are unfinished works until we're with him. I think that's what gives him so much patience with us is because he sees the end from the beginning and he knows our faults, our failures, all those mistakes. And in the eternal sense, he knows every sin you will ever commit in your whole life. And he loves you anyway. And he has grace for you through all of that. Because he knows the end from the beginning. He knows how you will be when you stand before him. And so we learn more and more of him. We learn more of his love and his grace. And in all of that, we find out how amazing it is. We find out that through all that, through grace, we have peace with God. We have access to God. We have hope in God. I don't think we can ever look too closely or too often at the wonder of grace. That God would extend mercy and love to us and we would be free from the real repercussions of what we rightly deserve. That God sees you as his poem. He doesn't grow weary of working on us and in us and through us. He will be faithful to complete the work he began in you as much as you probably don't feel like it. You are God's workmanship. We looked at all that Paul had written about what God has done for us. And then he asked us to remember. He asked us to remember what we have in God's grace. And we looked at that when we studied chapter two, the church is a temple. And that does not speak of a physical building. Again, this is nice. This is where we meet. This is our church building. But what Paul says there in chapter 2 is that we are the church. It's not the building, it's us. Every single person that has ever lived, that has come to know Jesus Christ, is his church, his habitation, his dwelling place. We meet here to be equipped to go out there. We meet here to go out there. This is our meeting place where we become equipped to then go be like him to other people out there. That's why we come here. This is, we call it our church. That's great, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. This is our church building. But don't lose sight that once you all leave, the church left, you're all out there. And that's where we really need to be the church. We can be in that safe cloister of church and churchiness and be churchy and have our potlucks and do stuff we like. And that's all good, that's okay. But if we're not being the church out there, then we're failing in our calling. We're failing in what the Lord has called us to do, to be like him. What does the word Christian mean? It means little Christ, little Christ. And if we're going to be a little Christ, we can't just do that inside here. We gotta do it out there because that's where people need to know his love. The church is a temple and as that, that means that we are made for habitation. We are made for community. We are made to dwell in his presence. We are made for communion. We are made for unity. We are made for all those things. Paul made it clear that in Jesus, all walls are gone. That there is no longer any separation or any difference in standing before Jesus Christ. That all walls are gone. 
The wall of separation, he said, is gone because the common lordship is greater than any previous division. And I said it the past three weeks, and I'm going to say it again. If the lordship of Jesus Christ is not greater than any difference you have with others, be it political, racial, economic, language, geography, or whatever, then you have not fully understood what it means to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Because he is the head of his church, and that encompasses all people that have come to know him. Jesus died for all, so that all of us could be grafted into his family. There is no difference at all. In Jesus Christ, we all have unity through the Spirit of God and commonality in the family of God and equality before Him and before His throne because of what He has done for us. And this unity didn't just happen. It was hard fought in the accomplishment of Jesus Christ. It cost Him His life. It cost Him everything to get to the point where we could have unity in the Spirit. And that means that Jesus, when he prayed in John 17, where he said, may they all be one as we are one. That wasn't just an idle prayer. It was a prayer Jesus prayed knowing that his work of the cross would accomplish the answer. And it was a prayer he was willing to pray, pray because he knew the agony he was about to face was worth it to him. Because you were worth it to him to go through it. And after going through all that, in chapter 3, Paul begins with, for this reason. After all, Paul spoke of how the church is a body and the church is a temple. In chapter 3, he told of how the church is a mystery. That the Gentiles would be fellow heirs of the same body. This describes the mystery itself, that believing in Jesus and believing in uh, uh, in Jesus means that believing Jews and believing Gentiles are joined together into one body of Christ, into one church, and no longer separated before God as such. And the truth of the mystery means that Gentiles are now full partakers of the promise. And this was a privilege no longer reserved only for the believing Jew. And you could only happen through the gospel where all mankind have equal standing in Jesus Christ. It's the same gospel Paul is a servant of because of the gift of grace given to him by the working of God's power. That's the mystery of God's great plan and purpose that was hidden, but now through Jesus Christ is revealed. And Paul is calling us to consider the greatness of that plan for the ages and consider our place in that plan. Paul called it the dispensation of the fullness of times. That's what he called it. It sounds real fancy. The dispensation of the fullness of times. I can sound real intelligent when I say that. Dispensation. It's a really good word. But dispensation is a word that means management, oversight, or administration. In other words, God has had an ageless plan that he purposed and put in place, and then he managed it through to completion, all in the proper time that he had ordained for it all to happen. He managed the plan for how mankind would be able to experience grace before him. And the mystery revealed is that God's ultimate plan is to bring together and ultimately resolve all things in Christ Jesus, either through Jesus Christ as Savior or Jesus Christ as Judge. And in the fullness of time, when all who are willing are brought in, at some point God's plan will be complete. And the word for gather together that he used had the idea to unite and to sum up, meaning at the end everything will make sense. Everything will sum up. Everything will add up. Paul's idea is that God will make all things add up at the end. And right now he's in the process of coming to that final sum. And the day when every wrong will be righted, every matter resolved according to God's holy love and justice, that in the fullness of times, God will gather together essentially to sum up or resolve all things in Jesus. The mystery of the unified body of Christ is according to that purpose. And it's a preview of what Jesus will ultimately do in the fulfillment of summing up all things in himself. Now, after all of that, Paul closed out chapter 3 by praying for the Ephesian believers. In chapter 3, verse 14, he said this, For this reason I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, 
that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And in that prayer, Paul had four petitions that he asked of God for the believers in Ephesus. First, that they might be strengthened. Secondly, he prayed that, they, that Jesus would fulfill the promise he made in John 14, 23, where he said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. And Paul goes on from there to his third petition that, that we may know the, the amazing dimensions of the knowledge surpassing love of Jesus Christ, the height, the width, the depth, all, all of the, the, the things that we can't even begin to fathom of how big God's love for us is. And then fourthly, Paul prayed that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. And then Paul closed out his prayer with praise and blessing. And it's from there, it's from there that Paul then begins chapter four, that Paul shifts to begin to speak of what our response to all of that should be what our response should be in chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now, looking at how he called us to live, it's clear. Paul is speaking to those who have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what he, who he's speaking to in chapter 4, verse 1. He's not speaking to everyone. He's speaking to those who have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord. All those who have accepted the free gift of God's grace and salvation. Those who recognize that they have sinned and are in need of a Savior. Those who have acknowledged that Jesus Christ died on the cross with the purpose of being the one true sacrifice for the sins of all mankind, that he died on that cross, was buried in the tomb, that he rose again, that he was resurrected the third day, just as the scriptures say. And we're told in Romans 10, 8, 9 and 10, that, it, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you purport to be one who follows Christ, then this instruction from Paul is meant for you. That's what it means. And when you look at it, that means as one who calls himself a Christian, we don't have the right to see this as an optional suggestion. This isn't our option. Paul is begging us to look at this as Christians because this is what God has instructed us to do, which doesn't make it optional if we want to be called a Christian. And if you want to be called a Christian, then knowing the expectations and being obedient to the expectations of the one you purport to follow cannot be unimportant to you. Or stop calling yourself a Christian. Because if it's unimportant to you, then you're not being a little Christ. You're not being a follower of Christ. But if you want to call yourself a Christian, then these are things that we have to seriously look at and maintain in our lives. And at the same time, as Christians striving to be little Christ, living to be an imitator of God as dear children are walking in love as Christ also walked in love, that is what we should strive to do. And there should be that expectation that we hold ourselves to. We tend to spend a lot of time though, I think as Christians, we spend a lot of time watching and checking to judge whether or not we see this behavior in others. I think we're really good at that. We're really good at looking at how everyone else is doing with their walk before the Lord, whether they're being Christians or not. And then we tend to look down on those who aren't following Christ in the way we think they should be. All the while, all the while, we're expecting grace and mercy from them for our mistakes. 
We shouldn't be surprised by unbelievers who do not live according to the commands we've been given to live as believers. They're unbelievers. They're not believing. They're not followers of Christ. We purport to be. And that means we should be standing in this battle. But we sure tend to settle for a Christianity that looks a whole lot more like what the world looks like than what we've been commanded to live by. So, if you're not a Christian, a follower of Christ, God's not asking you to do these commands that are here in this letter. First, you have to become a child of God. That he is asking you to do. If you're not a follower of Christ, I, I would beseech you, I would beg you, just like Paul did, to become a follower of Christ, to give your life to him. But you must become a member of his body. You must come in salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You must respond to the love of God shown through Jesus Christ because the type of things listed in this letter are only truly achievable through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's nothing we can muster up in and of ourselves. This isn't our natural inclination. This isn't what we're prone to do. We have way too much of our own flesh in us to be able to do this. But what follows in the rest of the letter to the Ephesians is meant for those who have been redeemed and have come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, if that's you, then listen, because this is how we are to be living. And if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ yet, then listen, because once you are, these are the expectations you're signing up for. Chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. And with Paul begging us to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, he lays out for us what that should look like with two main themes. He lays out what our character should look like and that we should maintain unity. And then he breaks down what that unity looks like. So character and unity is what he talks about in these first few verses. Chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, there are other places where Paul lays out what the character of a Christian should look like, and in some lists he goes into much greater detail, in some less. Here, Paul gives us four things. He only gives us four things, and those four things are hard enough for us to do, much less everything else that is there. Walking worthy of our call means we should have in our character lowliness. Now, before Christianity, the word lowliness always had a bad association to it. And in the minds of many, even inside of Christianity, it still does. But the reality is it's a glorious Christian virtue, lowliness. It means that we can be happy and content when we are not in control or steering things our own way or our way. That's what lowliness is. It doesn't mean that you have to be debased. It doesn't mean that you have to lay in the mud. It doesn't mean all of that. It means that we can be happy and content when we are not in control or steering things our way. Walking worthy of the call means we should have in our character gentleness, or in some translations, meekness, but they mean the same thing. Gentleness, meekness, being teachable. It doesn't mean being wimpy or passive. It doesn't mean being a doormat. The quality, it means the quality of a man who is always angry at the right time, but never at the wrong time. Because we're told to be angry and sin not. We're not told don't ever be angry. We're told to be angry and sin not. And so gentleness, meekness is the quality of a man who's always angry at the right time, never at the wrong time. And it means strength under control. And I've used this example before, but it's, it's likened to a strong stallion. A horse and when I was at Fresno State going to school I've told this illustration before that there was a rancher there and he had a horse that he was trying to break and it was beautiful it was a beautiful black horse it was just strong and he would just run all day long up and down the fence line and the rancher would just stand there watching I would watch the horse run up and down the fence line and then after a few weeks or whatever he he got in the pen with the horse and then after that he was able to put a bridle on the horse. Ultimately, he got to a point where he could put a saddle on the horse. Ultimately, he got to the point where he could ride the horse. And that's what meekness is. Meekness is all that strength of a strong stallion under the control of the rider. Under the control of the rider, where he doesn't have to be forced to go somewhere, 
But with a touch of the rein on the neck, he knows to go that way. Touch of the rein on the neck, he knows to go that way. That he's, all that strength is still there, but it's under the control of the rider. And that's what meekness, gentleness is in the biblical sense. To be able to walk with all that strength and all that power under the control of the Holy Spirit. Gentleness, meekness is a willingness to stand and do the will of God regardless of the cost. It's bowing yourself to the will of God. And we have a picture of what that looks like in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 it says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Verse 3 says, let, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross." Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, what did lowliness, gentleness, and meekness look like in that passage in Philippians? It said, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So it describes humility. We should be walking in humility. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. We should have compassionate care towards other people and not be selfish. And we have the example of Jesus Christ where he says, let this mind be in you as which was in Christ Jesus. Jesus was the, the only perfect example of all of this lived out that it ever has lived and ever will live. He is the only one who has done this in perfection. He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. All powerful, almighty God, God incarnate, Jesus Christ, lived in lowliness and gentleness and meekness like no other before and no other will be able to since he lived. And yet he walked in the right power and authority of being perfectly in the will of God. He walked in absolute power and authority inside of it. There's no room in Christianity for selfish ambition, pride, and conceit. Humility is not a false thing. It can't be played at. People can see through fake. People can see through fake. A false humility does no good, but it has to be born of love. First of God, as the greatest commandment says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And out of that, the second is like the other. Love others as yourself. That can only come through the real relationship with Jesus Christ. Walking worthy of our call means we should have in our character long-suffering, bearing with one another in love as well. Long-suffering is the ability to face adversity, injury, reproach, being patient enough to wait for the improvement in those who have done you wrong. That's the hard part of long-suffering, isn't it? It's the being patient with others who have done you wrong. And that's the hard part, I think, in long-suffering. One definition of long-suffering is the spirit that has the power to take revenge, but never does. It's a characteristic of a forgiving, generous heart. It isn't about exacting revenge on other people. It doesn't mean just putting up with people. It means to prefer them in love, to see the best in them. It's the heart willing and ready to forgive wrongs or perceived wrongs. And it means to actually, genuinely, and really love other people. Walking worthy of our own call means that we should have the Christian character trait of endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. These humble, forgiving character traits and heart attitudes towards others naturally begin to fulfill this gift of unity in the Spirit. 
We must endeavor to keep this unity. That's what it says. Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We don't create unity. God never commands us to create unity among believers. That's his job. He created unity among believers. What he commands us to do is to recognize it and to endeavor to keep it. That's our role. You know, I've been all over the world. I've been all over the world. And I've fellowshiped with believers in Europe, in Central America, all over Asia, many parts of Africa. And the fellowship, the brotherhood, the unity that I've seen, no matter where I've gone in the world, that's the commonality in Jesus Christ is amazing to me. There is no difference in relationship in Jesus Christ, no matter where I've been in all the world. A believer that knows Jesus Christ brings that brotherhood. It brings that unity. It brings that fellowship. It knits hearts together. And I have brothers and sisters all over the world that I've been able to pray with. I know of Christians in underground churches in China who are praying for me. And I'm like, that blows me away. That with all they're going through, they would go, I'd be praying for you. I'm like, oh, there's power in that prayer. I want you to pray for me, absolutely. But I've been all over the place. And it's evident in the quick fellowship possible among Christians of different backgrounds, nationalities, language, and economic classes that a spiritual unity is real. And the thing that breaks it up typically is our own fault. Structural and denominational disunity. Where we think we've got something better than everyone else does. We know it more than everyone else does. We get prideful in our self-righteousness. But Jesus Christ is coming back for one church. One church. It's not just Calvary Chapel, Momel. He's coming back for His church. Every single person that has come to know Him. And that unity in the body of Christ is supposed to be there. And I think the disunity we have in the collective church as a whole is an embarrassment. Because God has called us to be one body. And we can't make this unity. We can't strive or force this unity. Only the Holy Spirit makes this unity in the church. But we are to maintain it, fight for it, guard it, watch over it, protect it, and value it as an important thing. All true believers in Jesus Christ belong to one body, one church. And out of anyone, anywhere, we as Christians should realize that we are one in Christ. And Paul goes on to give us a description of what unity in the church looks like. In chapter 4, verse 4, he says, There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We have unity because of what we share in common, Jesus Christ. In Jesus, we share one body, one spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one Father. And each of these common areas is greater than any potential difference. And Paul gives us seven aspects of that unity. He says we're one body, that every Christian from the day of Pentecost to the rapture of the church make up the entirety of the body of Christ when we are all one in him, through him, and with him. He said that we are one spirit, that there's one Holy Spirit that moves in the life of every believer. And he baptizes each one into the body of Christ. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to build unity in the church. And that's the unity that we are instructed to keep. We said, he said there's one hope of our calling. In Titus 2.13, it says that our blessed hope is the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's the goal set before all believers. That's the end zone. That's the goal we are to reach. And that's what our hope is, to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. He said there's one Lord, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's His Lordship alone that we are to recognize and keep. His Lordship in the church is what's to be preeminent. There's one faith, speaking of the body of truth, of the apostles' doctrine. Now division comes when doctrine is set aside for the sake of opinion. That's a dangerous place to go. Opinion. We have been left an instruction manual. And the substance of the doctrine left us by the apostles is critical. And when we begin to throw away things we don't like and only hold on to cherry-picked verses that make us feel better, then division comes. Things begin to break down. Strife 
follows, and we embarrass the name of Jesus Christ over petty differences instead of resting in the joy of our salvation and what God has told us to do. We don't get that luxury as believers. It's God's word. And that means he alone is the owner of it. And he alone is the one who gets the right to say what it is. It's not the word of Brad. It's the word of God. You are very lucky it's not the word of Brad. But it's the word of God. That's much more infallible. The really is critical to the point that Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 6. After going over points in doctrine and instruction for Timothy. He tells us to teach and instruct these things. And in 1 Timothy 6, 3, he says, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men with corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. Godliness with contentment is great gain. In Proverbs 6, we, 6, 16 through 19, we are told some things that God hates. We're told a few things that God hates. Solomon wrote, one who sows discord among the brethren is something that God hates. God loves unity. He paid a great price for us to have unity. And he holds it in such high regard that he said, one who sows discord among the brethren is something he hates. Now, Timothy, the instruction to Timothy, where he says, from such withdraw yourself, from a man who's causing all those issues, those problems, those teaching wrong things, you realize that's inside the church. That doesn't mean withdraw yourself from people who need to know the love of Jesus Christ. Oh, you don't believe what I do. You're so in discord, I'm not going to talk to you. No, that's not what that means. All the more talk to non-believers about the Lord is talking about inside the church. God holds unity so high that he said people that are causing division inside the church from such withdraw yourself. And there's a purpose to that. We're told in, in another epistle that it's like heaping coals on their head. It's with the hope of them coming back to right relationship with Jesus. It's not to castigate them to the point and shun them to the point that they have no hope and are destroyed. But it's with the purpose of restoration and reconciliation and rebuilding unity. That's the purpose. But God will not stand idly by for disunity. God takes unity that serious. And if he takes it that serious, we should too. And then he said there's one baptism. And this is speaking of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that comes at the moment of salvation. He's not saying, no, 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 there's no water baptism. There's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit or water baptism. No, he's not saying that. There's one baptism in the Holy Spirit. There's one baptism into the family of God. At the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells in us. And when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are promised the Holy Spirit will be our helper. And he said, there's one God and Father of all. And this is God's fatherhood of believers. He's not the father of unbelievers. Being a part of God's family only comes through Jesus Christ, but anyone who calls on him becomes part of God's family right then. Anyone can be grafted into the family of God. In the church, we should be fighting to hold on to unity. We should be endeavoring to keep the unity in the bond of peace. Chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you call. You know, it really comes down to this. It comes down to love, grace, and forgiveness. Love, grace, and forgiveness. Love, grace, and forgiveness is what we've received from Jesus Christ. And if we are going to hold on to unity in the bond of peace, then love, grace, and forgiveness has to be given to each other even inside of all of our many failures, even inside of the mistakes and the sins we commit, even inside of all of our shortcomings, love, grace, and forgiveness has to be given. The problem in the church is that we all have a flesh nature still, and it's attached to your spiritual body. 
That's the problem with all of us, is we still have a flesh nature. And that flesh nature tends to be what's the most visible to all of us. But we're to be long-suffering with each other. Realizing that that person that has a flesh nature is God's poem. That person that still has a flesh nature is God's masterpiece. God's person that still has that flesh, flesh nature is God's work of art. That God's looking at us in that way. And that's how we're to be looking at each other. And I think when we see how God sees us in that way, then we can start being a whole lot more forgiving with each other in that way. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 gives us such a view of love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now in part, then I shall know just as I am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. We can do all things trying to honor God with our lives, trying to work for Him, trying to do great things for Him. But if we're doing it without love, it doesn't amount to anything. Love is preeminent. What's the greatest commandment? I said it earlier. This is a pop quiz. Seeing if you guys are listening. What's the greatest commandment that Jesus gave us? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And He said the second is likened unto it. To love your neighbor as yourself. Two things Jesus gave us to do. We struggle with those two things. (laughs) He took all the Ten Commandments and he summed them up in two things. Love God. And out of loving God, love each other. Because everything else flows from that. We all have a past to deal with. We all have a flesh nature to deal with. We all have the struggles of life and the history of mistakes and a future that will be all of that too until the day we're standing before Jesus and we no longer have all that to deal with. And unity is a big deal, which means forgiveness and love and grace with each other are big deals. We can't be imitating God or walking in love as Jesus did without them. If you're struggling in any of those areas, Start with that first commandment. Learn what it means to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And when we read through the book of Ephesians, those first three chapters tell us of that outpouring of love, of all that God did for us, all that He's done for us in grace and mercy, the sacrifice that He made for us. And out of all that great love, then Paul says, Now, walk worthy of the car love each other and strive to maintain unity. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you've done for us. That we have your word. That we can learn how to follow you. That we can become more like you. Oh Lord, we need you so desperately. These are things we can't do in and of ourselves. These are things we don't do in our natural inclination. But, oh, Lord, I pray that you would bind us together in your spirit in the unity of peace. And that we would bear fruit for you. That we would bring you pleasure. That we would bring you glory as we go about our lives. And, Lord, just being in here, that we would be equipped to now go out and replicate ourselves in a world that needs you so desperately. With people that need to know how much you love them. The grace you have for them the mercy that you show. Oh Lord, may we be more like you. We need you. Thank you, God, for your great love.
Thank you for what you've done for us. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.